Hi, I'm Bob Garlick, your host. Welcome to season three of the Business Book Talk podcast. On each show, we will discover another great book that can help you improve yourself and your business. So I invite you to sit back and enjoy this week's author and find out what makes this book a great read. Hi, everybody. I've got uh, Tim Cooper, who uh, helped edit this book, uh, put it together and organize it. We'll find out exactly what he did in a bit. It's called Longer Lasting Products, Alternatives to Throwaway Society. And oh, my God, do we need to read a book like this? Uh, It is uh, definitely very, very practical, lots of information in it. But before we get into the book a little bit more, Tim, what have you been doing recently? Well, we've been recently uh, looking at the clothing industry, fashion industry. In Britain, we throw around around about a million tons of clothing. Um, some of it is reused, often it's sent to the third world, but, but much, much fashion these days, it's, it's very short-lived, uh, almost by definition. It is, they are fashion items, they're designed for one season. So uh, there, there's a lot of uh, interest now in, in, in addressing that particular industry. Hmm. You know what? It was... Um it's interesting because there's been this new trend, well, I mean, a new trend, but an, an ongoing uh, trend here in uh, North America for people to really get into thrift stores. And shopping in a thrift store isn't as, uh, you don't get as ostracized as much. In fact, it's, it's, a, it's a point of pride with a lot of people. They say, hey, check out, I got this amazing shirt. And you say, hey, you look fantastic. How much did you pay? I said, oh, I paid four bucks. So you're saving money and you're recycling. Um, before we get into that too much, um, Let's talk a little bit about the premise of the book, what got you started. Why did you guys decide to get into the book? Well, the origin to the book, I guess, can be traced back, gosh, 15 years or so ago when, uh, before I uh, went back into university because I was out working in industry for 15 years, uh, I did some work for an organization in the UK called the New Economics Foundation. And we are the... uh, the luck to be funded to do some blue sky thinking on materials and energy conservation. And at that time, we're talking the early 1990s here, there was a lot of work being done on recycling. And we didn't want to do stuff that was being done already. We wanted to to push out the boundaries. But what we found when we were sort of scoping the area was that there was very little that was being talked about with regard to how long things last. So whereas late 60s, early 1970s, the whole idea of planned obsolescence was very much in the, in the public news, a famous book by Vance Packard called The Wastemakers, sold millions of copies. He was a journalist, so he attracted the, the newspapers to cover lots of articles in it. Um, but since then, through the sort of boom years of the 80s and 1990s, very little attention was was going on to, to how long things last and yet there seemed to be evidence that things that were once designed to last to be an investment were increasingly being designed to be short-lived so let me give you one simple example the toaster i grew up in an era 1950s 1960s where when you bought a toaster the thing that was most likely to fail the element could be replaced but now Ninety percent of toasters, you can't replace the element. So when it fails, you, hold, you throw the whole thing away. And that was just something that sort of sparked a thought in in my mind and other people's mind that we need to to to, to explore this this uh, throwaway culture in a bit more detail. You know what's interesting about that, and and I think it's the economics of it too. There, there's you know I had a client and they sold beautiful beautiful furniture, and their whole premise was is look you're you're buying something that's going to be in the family for maybe two or three generations, and that's why it costs twelve thousand dollars for a couch. Is it economically unfeasible to be less wasteful? because it's too expensive to produce products that will last for 50, 60, or 100 years? No. I think the problem is we need to reconfigure what we make. We need to change expectations to create the kind of society where making things that last becomes economically viable, commercially attractive. There's no fundamental reason why you can't do that. We already live in a world where you can buy things that are designed to last. If you take something like, for example, 
large white appliances like refrigerators, dishwashers, washing machines. In the UK, you can buy them. They're made by a German company called Miele. The trouble is, and, and they're designed to last for 20 years. They actually say that. They're designed to last for 20 years. The trouble is, they're about 50% more expensive than other products. Even though those other products might only have a third of the lifespan, they might be discarded after five to 10 years. The trouble is, people's priorities are such that they, they feel they can't afford the more expensive one, even though maybe in the longer term, it's offering them better value for money. Because we, we seem to have this desire, this proclivity for buying more stuff rather than fewer but better quality stuff. You know, that, that's so true. It, it's uh, the consumer mentality where, you know, we, we work very hard these days. We don't really have a lot of off time. When What's the justification of, of spending your whole life working? Well, it's to buy things, to reward myself for basically uh, using all my time up to make money so I can buy more stuff so I can get happy. Is it um, a shift, a culture shift that has to take place where buying new things doesn't give you that reward within the society? Will, is, is that what we need, something that fundamental as a change? I don't think you'll ever get away from a situation whereby when, when people who are, who are working pretty hard feel that they want to have some kind of compensation, if you put it like that, um, or just maybe in a more positive way, they want to feel that when they work and have money to spend, they don't want to buy something that, that isn't very nice. They do, they do want to buy something that's, that's good. The trouble is we, we actually make it inconvenient to actually maintain those things over mm. time. So that when something fails, it's quite often the case that people don't think about getting things repaired anymore. They don't want to keep it. They've seen something which is new. It may be only um, different at a very superficial level from what they've owned already. But the whole repair and upgrade system that we used to have has begun to, well, it's not beginning to die a death, it's been gradually dying a death o o over time. And it becomes a self-perpetuating problem that you tend to buy cheap because you don't really want to repair things, so you throw it away because that's the sort of, that's the thing people are doing. And then because the repair uh, people aren't getting so much money, not getting so much uh, trade, if you like, they then have to charge more money to actually bring any, any decent revenue into themselves. So you have uh, this problem whereby new goods are becoming cheaper, often because they're being made in, in the Far East where labor costs are less, and repair is becoming more expensive. So it becomes really embedded in our system. Yeah, it's a, it's a spiral. It's, it's, well, a negative spiral or, or, or a positive spiral for consumerism, that's for sure. Um, do you think that the concept of repair could be brought up um, as a fundamental educational thing in schools where, where children are shown, it's like, look, you know, here's a toaster and this is how you fix it. Or, or if something small breaks or, or, or plasticky breaks, this is how you can fix it so they're not just throwing it away. I think we need to work in schools to maintain, if not increase, people's understanding of design and technology. And, and in, in Britain, we're seeing this under threat. That people are saying that we don't need to know how to make things anymore. Um, and design and technology education, that, that, that ought to be something which is uh, essentially that all, all young people do to help us to understand the insides of products. Because what's happened over, over the years is that fewer and fewer people actually knows what goes on inside a product. Well, you know, we're basically we're told to buy the stuff and use it and then, and then throw it away. Whereas 20, 30 years ago, people would open things up and if a toaster had a medium repairing, uh, people would repair it. If uh, the TV, well, not TVs so much, but but, but other products, they, 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 they'd they be into the kind of make it and fix it kind of culture. That's, that seems to uh, have die to death. So yeah, we, 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 we do, yes, we do need to find ways of engaging people. And there is a, there are signs of a revival in that. You know, there are magazines out there, there there's evidence that, that there, is, there are still people who, who do have this positive relationship with the things they own and they do want to uh, keep hold of things and look after things. The trouble is they're in a the minority. Yeah. Here in North America, it's called modding, where you actually take a perfectly normal computer and then you actually enhance it uh you take uh, 
uh, your bicycle and you add things to it uh, and to make it your own and make it stand out and make it special. And uh, I think, yeah, that takes a certain ter- type of person, a certain type of personality and skill set. And there, 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 and there are ways of doing that. There are ways of making things easy uh, for, for individuals to, to look after things. I, th- I think we're, in, in, I'm not a designer, I'm a social scientist, but my, I speak to designers and, and they, they tell me that the kind of things that they do to a degree on computers. So, f- I mean, most people, they, they have to know something about how computers operate to, to be able to, f- to fix out, you know, little, little problems that arrive periodically. The computer's a bit slow, so they, they need to know what might be causing that. But it doesn't go that far, and it, it certainly doesn't cross uh, to many other products. But, for example, there's, there's a chapter in, in, in the book about uh, refrigerators. A guy was doing some work trying to understand uh, how people use refrigerators. For example, if you open the door, how, how, open do you, how often do you open the door? That has big implications, for example, for energy consumption. But by putting some equipment on, on the back of the, the refrigerator to, to find that out, we began to become aware that you can actually find out a lot more about the, con- the, the, um, the refrigerator and use that to improve the engagement of the user with their product. For example, you can have uh, equipment uh, within the refrigerator which could help you to, to find out have, uh, if something goes wrong. Um, so you can find out what part of the comp- what component that that might be. Uh, you could have information there about when it was made. So if, for example, you want to sell that that product on, there's some uh, information there about who made it, what year, uh, maybe how many times it had been sold. So so there are ways of actually designing into products improve communication between the owner and the product and possible future owners. One of the things I've, I've learned a lot in recent years is we need to get away from the idea that just one person owns something. And this is huge market out there that's grown in recent years, eBay. Um, you mentioned thrift shops. There are, there, we have to recognize that products may fail, but also people may fall out of love with their products. They may have different needs arising. And we need to equip the system uh, and the problems often that are systemic with a way of ensuring that when one person no longer wants something, other people who might want it find it, have access to it, and in particular have confidence that, that it will work well. One of the problems with, with um, so much sort of second-hand electrical goods is, is you go in there and you really don't know what's been, how it's been treated, you know, what, what condition it's in. So that, that tends to reinforce people's preference for buying new, and if necessary, buying cheap, because often people buy cheaper products because they can't afford the best quality but don't want to risk the second-hand ones. Let's talk a little bit about the book. And you, know, you came in and you're, you're the editor of this book. You've got a lot of different writers that have uh, basically uh, put a lot of energy into, into the, the stories. Why did you approach the book this way? What I wanted to do w- was recognize the fact that the throwaway culture is a complex phenomena. It's not going to be solved easily. It needs to be understood from many different dimensions. So, for example, Designers have something to say about it. People in marketing and sales have something to say about it. People who understand consumer law have something to say about it. Designers, engineers, a whole range of different disciplines uh, as well have something to say. So the premise was that it has to be a multidisciplinary book. It came together uh, because I got funding a few years ago to bring together people to speak at a series of seminars and at those seminars, people started raising some ideas that I found interesting, exciting, uh, insightful. So I brought together those people and some others. I'd read some articles and, and thought people had something to say uh, that was extra. And in the end, we had I think, 18 different uh, people came together and I structured the book around particular themes. So there's a kind of historical opening. Uh, it then moves on to design, and people are coming into design from quite different uh, positions, and, and, and some are very much into the, the technology within the products. Uh, other people are more into the systems that 
uh, underpin what's sold in society. So uh, there's some interesting ideas there from different designs. We looked at the law. We looked at um, a couple of lawyers came in, one of specialising in, in uh, consumer legislation with regard to what the expectations are when you buy a bra as to how long it ought to last. Another uh, lawyer specialised in, in after-sales services and, and guarantees. So we had a couple of chapters looking at that. Um, we then looked at marketing uh, and how you might sell things that last longer. What are the obstacles? Why, why at the moment, is the marketing profession locked into the throwaway culture? And, and what, what marketers need to learn from this discussion so they then can, uh, if you like, move in a different direction to equip themselves to, to sell longer lasting products uh, and at the end we, we looked at consumers and the products uh, in use um, and the state of disposal and the situation with regards to well when someone does throw something away what kind of systems are needed to ensure that the, the, the products that are still usable when they're discarded find another user um, you know the if I pick up the book and I, I'm, I'm gonna gonna read it, how should I approach the book? Is it something that I can jump around in, or, or are there sections of the book I should read and then jump around? I think it's the kind of book. It's it's a long book. It's over 400 pages. It's not really designed for for bedtime reading. Page one through to page 416. Uh, it's it's designed so that. The chapters are a standalone. This, there's a, a short section at the very beginning which puts it all in context and says what, what's in there, the summary of each of the chapters. So you can spend a, a few minutes uh, reading about the book uh, and then you can do what you want. I mean, most people probably read the, the context section, the historical section that the whole thing starts off with. But then if you're a designer, you might just, just, just pick up the first uh, uh, section and, and read half a dozen chapters there. Marketers consumer lawyers, whatever. They might check, just just do the, the, the chapters that relate to their particular discipline. Um, but I think more and more people actually are, are interested in how the different disciplines relate to each other. So people will probably read it at their own pace, but read one chapter, one section, and, and then another. Um, you know, when you were putting this book together, you, you know, you, you said you had all these lectures and then and you got a chance to, to sit down with the people and discuss what they were going to do in the book. For you, what was the aha moment? Where, when was, when did it crystallize for you, or, or an idea that really stood out for you in the book? And you said, "Wow, that's amazing!" Now I really get it. I don't think there was one single aha moment, but I think what came across to me is is that there are in fact, three dimensions to the product that one needs to address. The first is to do with the product. What the physical artifact that's being made out there, what is that saying about the needs of the future? Is it saying it doesn't matter about the future? Is it saying I'm to be recycled, but you can make me short-lived because I'm going to be recycled? Is it I'm going to be designed to be to, to last, uh, uh, even to be upgraded in some way? In future, so there's there's one dimension is the the product and what that says about the kind of society we want in future. The second dimension is is, is the user. There's a chapter in the book there by a guy called Jonathan Chapman, who's a, a reader at the University of Brighton here in the UK. He's written a book called Emotionally Durable Design, and he's interested in the user product relationship, particularly the user uh, and the relationship. He he, he talks about. Um, the throwaway culture being essentially about failed relationships. You can almost draw a parallel between people and people and people and products here with the kind of language that's being used. You know, why do we fall, to, fall out of love with our products? The things that we actually spent hours maybe researching, shopping, acquiring, showing off, what, what, what leads us to uh, love those things but then no longer to, to love those things. And then the third dimension is the, syst the system, the systemic dimension. You can't, I don't think, just blame the manufacturers for our throwaway culture. 
nor the consumers. You have to look at uh, why it's so deeply rooted in our system. Why is it that we've talked about obsolescence for 40 years but haven't really done much about it to over overcome the, the problem? And most people see it as a problem. No one says it doesn't. Not many people see it, say it doesn't matter. So the problems are systemic. And, and we have then to look at, at the drivers behind it. And, and the drivers might be our values, but it also might be our economic system. You know, why is it, for example, that we have a system whereby uh, repair work is relatively expensive compared to buying new? And is that an inevitability or is it in, within the possible uh, power of governments to change the system? So, for example, you, taxes on repair come down and taxes on metals and minerals goes up. So it just tweaks the system to make the repair a little bit cheaper and buy new a little bit more expensive. You know, so there, there's some very interesting systemic issues that need to be dealt with. Let me give you one other example. Retailing. Why is it that when you want to buy new, you go to a nice shopping mall, often with coffee shops, perhaps with en entertainment stores nearby, make a day of it. If you want to have something repaired or upgraded, it's down a back alleyway, rather grubby street. It shows this sort of, this isn't for people who've made it, it's for people who can't do something better. We need to look at that. Even something like footwear, you know, why is it when you buy a shoe, you buy it for one shop and they're saying, buy this and then come and buy another one. Why, why aren't why aren't cobblers and shoe retailers part of the same shop? Why isn't it that the retailer of the shoe is saying, we're going to make sure you keep this as long as possible because it's a, a shoe we're proud of? Interesting issues, I think, for retailers there as to, as to whether they're, they're, they're going to survive 20, 50 years from now, whether we can carry on having this, this divided society between buying new and maintaining and servicing products. Mm. You know, it, it does seem like it, it has to be a fundamental shift. I do remember seeing a wonderful uh, presentation and TED Talks uh, a couple of years ago about the new type of or, or, or the, the new movement for barcodes and the, new, the, the third generation of barcodes where every component of anything that is manufactured would have its own barcode. And then the fourth generation where those barcodes would actually talk to the manufacturer saying, oh, by the way, I'm considered redundant now. Please replace me. Uh, and so it wouldn't be you would replace the whole unit. You would replace components because the components themselves inform the manufacturer that they needed to be replaced. So your, your product would last you know, indefinitely. Do you think that is a viable uh, way of looking at the future? I think it is. And I, I think it raises some very interesting questions, particularly about uh, if, if you take household appliances, um, about how industry could contribute towards this better future, this more sustainable future. Because what you've said there uh, immediately makes me think of standardization of components. Because there are so many things whereby if the components were standardized, it would be so easy, more easy and cheaper to, to swap things around, to replace things that, 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 that fail. Um, there are issues that I know about intellectual property, and a lot, a lot of it is it's just been done by, uh, by default. It's the way the system has evolved. If you take things, for example, for example like cell phones, mobile phones, and, and chargers. You know, for years, we had to buy a charger with a mobile phone. And it's only now, really, we're moving towards a system where the, the charger becoming standardized. And it doesn't matter what model you have, and maybe not it doesn't matter what manufacturer you have, you just buy a, a, a similar charger. So um, we, we, we need to get so much waste, you could get rid of society. If only um, there are agreements to work in a particular in a particular way uh, and uh, we need to go in that direction Be because many, many things that are inside the, the products that we buy they could be designed for for, for decades they're, not, they're things that don't change very much and won't change very much uh, yes we'll make some advantages in, in some of the things that, that we use but but often you know, you, you, you don't, there, are, there are no technical improvements possible in things, so standardize them. Mm, very good point. I mean, just looking at power plugs globally, there are different types of power plugs, which I find crazy. You know, in Europe, there's three or four types, so then you've got to have a bunch of different adapters, and then there's different power 
the, the overall, you know, here we are on the globe, we're all on the same planet, and yet we have different types of frequencies used in our power devices. So if you're in in uh, England, it's it's I think it's 240. In in the U.S., it's 110, and in Japan, it's 110, but it's a different cycle rate. So yeah. all those electronics, they don't actually don't function. You have to have a big uh, transformer. I mean, that's a we can't even get the power that runs, and we are in electronics. You know, everything's electronic, not everything, but we're very driven through electronics. Why can't we even get something that fundamental figured out? Yeah. It's it, it, it it's a problem, and I think there there are historical problems, and there's there's also a, 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 an issue here, which I think one has to be um, a bit hesitant towards, which is that we can do things better, and and yet if someone said, well, we need to change all our plugs so they're the same as other parts of Europe, because in Britain it, we we differ from mainland Europe with 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 our plugs and sockets, um, that might be very good for the manufacturers of plugs and sockets, but of course it would actually lead to a lot of things being obsolete and, and a lot of unnecessary change. So you can <laughs> yeah. change some things, but other things you just have to leave alone. Yeah, I, I think it's it's a lot of with with a lot of these solutions and theories, it's going to take a long time for it slowly to you know evolve in that direction. In the book, the philosophy of the book, and 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 you know the the push in this book is for people to realize this is an issue and it's time to start thinking in that direction i think so i think that, that it actually captures something that's in the back of a lot of people's minds um particularly people of uh um, middle age and older who who can remember the days when things really were designed to last and can remember the the culture of the time which was still to to buy many of their household goods as if they were always going to have them. I, I can, for example, remember my parents' fridge. Now, their, their, their fridge, they, they bought it when they got married, and it was still there the day they died. It was, it was 37 years old. I, I know that because I entered to the house and realized that, wow, it, was, it wasn't a hard moment. It was kind of, well, why, why are people's expectations so short now? Okay, fridges are more energy efficient now, but we've probably reached the limit in terms of how efficient uh, we, can, we can make a fridge, certainly for the foreseeable future. So, so why on earth are, uh, are people buying fridges designed to last for, for less than 20 years? Um, it, it, it just seems crazy. The same with furniture. There's so many people who are buying chairs, settees, three-piece suites. They're just, just, they're just rubbish. You speak to, as I do, to furniture designers, and they say that those, those will not last more than five years. They've been designed to meet a price point, uh, and they will soon collapse. Again, I can think of my own parents' um, three-piece suite. It never changed, and it was still comfortable those 37 years later on. It had been designed to last. It can be done. It takes us back to the, the question we went to, uh, we, we talked about uh, at, at the beginning, uh, willingness to pay. We do need to change that mindset. So people see good quality products, whether they're appliances, furniture, vehicles or whatever, as, as, as an investment, something for them to be proud of, something to keep. It's um, the pride in uh, building and, and do you think that stems from, or, or this, this consumer uh, products because of uh, the where we are? You know, it started with the industrial revolution, where products were mass made, you know, made in on mass, but were still very high quality. And then it became a bottom line issue, where it's like, you know, we, we've still got to produce, we've got to produce more, and we've got to produce more cost effectively because of competition. How can we make this uh, easier to do? Is that one of the underlying problems? I think so. I think we need to reach a position where people, when they go shopping, they're not just thinking about the bottom line, the price point, the so-called value, which often isn't good value, um, but have more insights and more information into how long the thing will last. And uh, there's a chapter in the book, which uh, uh, a couple of chapters in, in the book about about marketing. But one in particular uh, was done by a colleague of mine who went into shops and just looked at the information that was available in terms of someone who wanted 
something designed to last and whether they could differentiate between different products. So was there a label, for example, on a product that said this has been designed to last for at least 10 years or five years or whatever? Or, 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 or did they just have to guess? Uh, if they went to, if they looked around at posters, marketing material, if they spoke to a retailer system, could they, how much could they say about the durability of a product? You see, we've moved to a, a world now where certainly when you buy electrical appliances, you know what the energy consumption is going to be. Because in Europe, at least, that's regulated. You have to have a label on, on uh, many appliances to show what the energy efficiency of the product is. Why not durability? It's just as important environmentally because when you buy something, that is embodied carbon. You know, when you buy e equipment, that's been made using fossil fuels. So uh, it's equally important environmentally and it's equally important in terms of value for money as well. You want to know how much something is, is used up in terms of uh, its ongoing energy consumption and use. But you also want to know how long it's going to last so you know whether you are getting genuine value for money or, or you're just uh, meeting – thinking good because you've you feel it it, it met a price point that uh, it has been advertised to you so there I think there are big issues to, to deal with here about how much a consumer knows and how much a consumer ought to know about the the intrinsic quality of the product you know, we, we, it's good to have fashion it's good to have things that are designed in a new and creative way but but let's not forget at the end of the day we, we need to know the intrinsic uh, quality and value of the product, uh, not not just whether it meets our our latest uh, aspirations because of what we've read about in in a newspaper or a magazine about this year's this year's trend. Mm. Um, what about uh, technology driven things like cell phones and and tablets specifically because they seem to be the product of the year? They're evolving so quickly, and software is designed and redesigned and, and basically the code is made fatter and less efficient because the processor is more efficient so you can force, you know, you look at what you had as far as processing power 10 or 15 years ago and the software was designed to work with this uh, slower processor. These days we have incredibly powerful small devices that basically are small computers that fit in our pocket. But they're evolving all the time. You're getting new product coming out every six months or every couple of months in some cases. Uh, and you feel that, oh, okay, well, my, my phone's slow now, so I have to get a new one. I have to get a new one. I have to get a new one. Do you think there is any hope for something like the electronics industry? I think uh, if you're looking at this discussion in terms of waste and environmental sustainability, one has to look at the the bigger picture and although we get rid of millions of mobile phones cell phones every year in terms of how much metal is being used compare that with a car you know, why do our cars only last 10 years rather than 20 years or, or, or 30 years mm. so i wouldn't want to home in unduly on on small appliances which often are short-lived having said that I think the industry is going in the wrong direction. I was speaking to someone from one of the main manufacturers recently, and they were telling me that they've, they've moved towards using adhesives rather than screws within the mobile phone, which immediately means that they become irreparable because obviously as you, as you open them up, they then, they then fall apart and snap. The, there can, I think, be some kind of balance here between recognizing that we are developing newer and better goods all the time um, uh, but at the same time we, we, we can't have this acceleration of disposability in, in, in products why why is it that most phones now in the UK at least are sold on a two-year contract they're designed to last for two years many many anecdotes I've heard of people two years in one day and they start falling apart. There, there are ways of designing longer lasting phones, repairable phones, upgradable phones, because a lot of the stuff now in terms of improvement will be in apps. There won't be anything physical. There's nothing that's going to be physically wrong with the, with, with, with the mobile phone. It can be upgraded. So I, I think the manufacturers need to, to look at the, the five-year phone, the 10-year phone. I happen to know that a couple of years ago, Nokia did some work on what they called the five-year phone. For some reason, they didn't put it into the market, probably because they didn't want, they, they couldn't, didn't feel that they had the, the, the power within, within the industry to change the whole system, the whole culture. Um, but I think we need to look in, in that direction. There are 
phones are designed to last. Nokia do one. I'm not sure they still make it uh, or whether they've sold off the company, but it's called the Ver2, V-R-T-U, and it costs several thousand pounds. No one's going to throw away a mobile phone that costs several thousand pounds after a couple of years. So they do know how to make things last. The trouble is we, we, we need to change the, the culture, the system uh, in order to support longer lasting mobile phones and if you think about it just designing the phones to last four years rather than two halves the waste stream that's the kind of change we need mm. fascinating fascinating information and something that we're really not aware of tim where can people go if they want to get more information about this subject well the a growing number of people uh, interested in product longevity. Um, the book is, is obviously a starting point, but most of the names who've written that book are, uh, are thinking about this area, are writing this area. There are uh, areas that you can go to. There's a growing number of sites on um, repair work, for example. We haven't talked too much about the Netherlands, but a lot of thinking in terms of product longevity started off with a, a network in the late uh, 1980s called Eternally Yours. And um, they brought together Dutch designers to think about this. That's followed through and, and um, uh, there, there, is, there are websites on repair. In, a, in, in the Netherlands, there, there are more and more repair shops and repair days where people go and bring stuff to be repaired. So, the, so there are a great number of initiatives in this area. Um, the whole a area of collaborative consumption uh, that's been talked about recently. Um, websites on that where we can go to find out more about sharing. You know, I said a lot about the, the need for this to look at in different ways it is the products that aren't, aren't lasting there's also a, a, a need for people to uh, pass on things that uh, that they don't want anymore so you go on to for example a site called ecomodo in, in the uk which is promoting um, the sharing of, of unwanted products there, i think a, a quick website and you'll soon find stuff awesome tim thank you very much for your time thank you That was an awesome book. We have some great new books and authors for you to meet in the coming shows, and I know you will enjoy them immensely. You can contact me directly at contactbob.tell or visit our website at www.businessbooktalk.com. See you next week.